Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about these notes and go over some things, the key important parts that you should have seen on the video. The first one about nuclear fission, okay, nuclear fission, it occurs when very heavy nucleus, a very heavy nucleus, splits into two smaller nuclei, each more stable than the original. So we have a nuclei that's splitting to two more stable nuclei, all right? So I guess it should have been a nucleus. A nucleus that is splitting to two smaller, more stable nuclei. Most of the time, fission is occurring artificially. Okay. Somehow we bombard the nuclei with neutrons. Now in the video they showed a picture wasn't very clear. So here I put a better picture in. You can see that here is a neutron bombarding this nucleus. Now we don't know what this nucleus is. It could be many things. Okay, you're going to see the next slide we're going to use uranium. But ha what happens is the nucleus is split into two smaller nuclei and also other neutrons are given off. So this is just the first part of the nuclear fission. Now here is the actual uranium-235. It's an isotope of uranium. We take the neutron, okay? We blast it in there, and all of a sudden now, that uranium has one extra neutron. So it's uranium-236, and it splits into barium-144, <coughs> excuse me, and krypton-89, but it also gives off these three different neutrons. Now you can see the little yellow flashes in there. That is energy. That is energy that is released in this process. Now, if you look here, here is the first step we just saw. The uranium is split. Here are the three nuclei. Now, those three nuclei go on to split other uranium nucleus here and here, and thus we split again. So now, you're going to see that this is a what we call a chain reaction. One nuclei we started with is bombarded, splits into three. These three nuclei each bombard a different nucleus and split into three more. So we have one that goes to three, three that goes to nine, nine would then turn into 27, and so on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is what we call the chain reaction, okay? The chain reaction. Now that chain reaction is what drives what drives nuclear reactors fission reactions create large amounts of energy i told you in the video that one gram of uranium 235 can generate as much energy through fission as the combustion or the burning of 2000 700 kilograms of coal. So, fission reactions produce great amounts of energy. Now, when we have nuclear power plants, the most common isotopes that are used are uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Those are the most common ones that are used in nuclear reactors. Now, I did a pretty good job of describing this diagram here in your notes of just explaining how that this whole reaction, how this nuclear reactor right here eventually leads to an electric current over here.
Now the second part is fusion. Fission was the breaking down. Fusion, you're going to see, is the combination of two small nuclei into a larger, more stable nucleus. So fusion is putting two smaller nuclei together to have one. Fusion releases greater amounts of energy than fission. So if you have the same amount, the same mass, and I say, okay, which one has more energy? If it's undergoing fusion or fission, it's definitely fusion. Now, what did I tell you in the video was the most common, most common type of nuclear fusion that we see? The sun, okay? Fusion is the process but by which the sun and other stars generate energy. Now, nuclear chemistry, how do we use it? The one I'm going to talk about is the half-life. Okay. Half-life is the time that is required for half of a radioactive substance to disintegrate, disintegrate by radioactive decay. Now, here are some different half-lives. You can see that here's carbon, which is based in thousands of years. Okay. Here's minutes, seconds. So half-lives vary greatly. Okay, they vary greatly. Now here's a question that you might see. This is very similar to one you see on WebAssign. It says that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,570 years. We just saw that on that table. How many years until one-eighth of a 50.4 gram sample of carbon-14 remains. Well, this mass right here is just given to you. You don't really need it because it doesn't matter when it's 50.4 grams or whether it's 50.4 tons. Okay, half of it still okay, decays in 5,570 years. So, if I'm looking at this, to go from the full amount, 100% to half, that takes me 5,570 years. To go from half to a quarter, which is half of the half, takes me another 5,570 years. To go from a quarter to the eighth, which is a half of a half of a half. Takes another 5,570 years. So, if I look, it takes one, two, three half-lifes to get from the full amount to one-eighth, correct? If I all add all those together, that will tell me that it's one th or 16,000 710. So, the answer to the question, the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,570 years. How many years until one-eighth of the sample remain? Well, that's how many, 16,710 years. Okay, could we go on past one-eighth? Absolutely, we just have to have another half-life. Okay, well, Technically, will it ever disappear? We could still keep cutting everything into a half, right? So technically, if we can, I mean, you know, but it's going to be very, very small amounts. Okay, did you ever hit zero on your lab the other day? Or did we stop at 20? Well, you probably stopped at 20 because you didn't hit zero. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 